Good evening, everybody. This is Steve with Real Progressives. We have a uh, breaking news update uh, right in my own backyard. The Lancaster uh, group is blo trying to block what has now been officially approved today, the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline. With me tonight is Tim Spies, who has been out there leading the charge. Tim, welcome to Real Progressive, sir. Thank you very much, Steve. So tell me, Tim, what is what is the group that you represent and, and what is going on with this pipeline? Uh, the group I represent is called Lancaster Against Pipelines, and we formed uh, nearly three years ago when we first heard about this 42-inch uh, high-pressure gas pipeline that was going to cut through Lancaster County, through the western edge of Lancaster County, through farms, through uh, pristine woodlands, um, and, uh, you know, the... the the opposition has grown uh, in the last three years, and we've always known this day would come. Uh, but today, uh, FERC, uh, ahead of their losing their quorum because of the re resignation of Norman Bay, uh, ramrodded a lot of projects uh, in and got them approved. And just at 4.45 today, we found out that this pipeline is going to go ahead. Um, we always knew that was going to happen sooner or later. Um, but uh, we vowed to fight this pipeline uh, through uh, nonviolent uh, direct action. And that's what we're uh, here to call for uh, for people to join us. And that's uh, one of the main reasons I'm here with you tonight. Excellent. So tell me, where exactly is this uh, the place of protest, if you will? Where exactly is it that the first line of defense is setting up? Uh, we chose this uh, location in Conestoga uh, at the invitation of some landowners. Um, the, the property in Conestoga is where they're going to be setting up their uh, horizontal direct drilling. Um, underneath the Conestoga River. So uh, we set up there for several reasons. Um, wh when they drill through this area, they're going to be going underneath or very near some very sensitive Native American um, uh, burial grounds. <clears throat> they will um, also be probably starting this first because it takes months to drill underneath the river. Uh, and also Conestoga has been the center of uh, the hotbed uh, of resistance for this pipeline. So for all those reasons, it was obvious that that's where we needed to go. So we're there. We're going to set up an encampment. We're going to be literally right across from Williams, Williams encampment uh, to do the drilling under the river. And we are there at the uh, with the permission of the landowner. So the landowner is going to have their property taken by eminent domain. And we're on a different part of their property. We're not on on the pipeline route, so we can stay there as long as we like. And we will start operations and disruptions and civil disobedience uh, from that encampment. Excellent. So tell me, um, how do people find you guys? I mean, like in terms of websites, w Facebook pages, whatever. How do, how do we get people engaged in this so we can so we can be of service to you? Uh, the Facebook page is Lancaster Against Pipeline. And our website is uh, wearelancastercounty.org. That's our website. Um, there There is another... Um, Facebook page is a group page that is not our official site. Our official site has the uh, the red and yellow logo on it. We are it's Lancaster against pipeline. Okay, so t tell me a little bit about the history of what you guys have been going through. You've known about this for some time. To your point, yeah. Talk, talk to us a little bit about the process by which we got to this point today. Well, the uh, the the process um, almost three years ago. Um, Mark and Melinda Clatterbuck uh, had someone knock on their door, and uh, the first day they talked to a land agent, uh, they were lied to. Land agent indicated that other people he had already talked to, and that's not true. Um, so the the the, um, the pipeline was supposed to go through Tuckwan Glen. Uh, what brought me on board with this whole fight was uh, you know, a lot of people screamed and yelled that you can't go through this pristine nature conservancy and the the Shank Flower Shanks Ferry Wildflower Preserve. Uh, so. Uh, William said, okay, we'll move the pipeline. And we all thought it was a big victory. Uh, then the next day, um, someone posted on Facebook, thanks, it's now in, now in my orchard. That's when we realized that, um, that this pipeline, we found out that the pipeline was for export, that this was about corporate greed, uh, that we had no right uh, to have any decision making whatsoever with what happened in our own backyard. That decision was being made by a board in Oklahoma of the Williams Corporation. And that's when we realized this wasn't about where to put the pipeline, but that there can be no pipeline. There's no, it serves no good to anyone in Lancaster County. It serves no good to anyone in the country. It only serves corporate uh, profit. And, and for that corporate profit, people will be asked to have a 42-inch high-pressure gas pipeline put on their property right next to their houses, in some case, 
and they will get no benefit from that whatsoever. They will have all the risk. They will have property devaluation. Uh, they are at risk of the explosion. Uh, everyone in a half mile radius has no chance of escape. All this for a corporation in Oklahoma and Texas to make a profit. And we just feel as though that is just wrong. Obviously, it's wrong. Absolutely. So, you know, obviously, you know, one of the things you and I discussed when we talked through um, your your um, the, the very, very um, unique situation you're in, Dakota Pipeline was directly on Sioux Reservation land. It was treated land. You had a very, very different experience. However, in Lancaster, that's not the case. And, and, and there was some concerns that you all had, and you wanted to make sure that people understood what it was that you guys were, were pushing for and, and, and how you were looking for activists to be engaged. Can you please talk to me about that? Talk to our followers about that so we don't have any misunderstandings so people can actively participate in a way that is both helpful and respectful. Uh, yeah, what, so there's, there's, some, there's some differences and there's some similarities to what's going on out in North Dakota. Um, for this pipeline, there's going to be no violation of a treaty. We don't have that. Everything is going to be, quote, unquote, uh, legal. Um, but there is also, uh, it's important to note the similarities are the uh, Manor, Conestoga, and Mordic Townships was described by an archaeologist at one of the FERC um, uh, scoping hearings as uh, the Machu Picchu of the Eastern uh, Native Americans. Uh, the, the, arche the archaeological um, um, sites along this route have been downplayed by the environmental impact statement. There's actually 80 some. And they've said in their in statement, there's seven. So you can't go anywhere through where this pipeline goes and not find native native remains, uh, encampments. Um, and for this pipeline to uh, plow right through them, uh, we feel is a desecration of, of that. Uh, but it's not just um, the Native American issue. That's a component of it, a very important component. We've had some people working very hard to document uh, the extent to which this pipeline will disrupt that. Uh, but there's also uh, one of the main things for us is just the use of eminent domain to take people's property. And there's no benefit whatsoever to people here. And you can take that all the way up to the uh, and this this ties in with uh, the Native American, the the, the, the Sioux's uh, uh, respect for the earth and the need to respect the earth. We've got 200 nations across the world that say we have to keep these fossil fuels in the ground. And here we are coming out of the Marcellus Shale frantically trying to build as many high pressure uh, gas pipelines as we can to export this gas overseas to perpetuate the use of natural gas which is not clean burning in the laboratory absolutely yes but the amount of methane leakage from these pipelines at the wells at the in the pipeline at the lng um, uh, facilities and overseas where it's used uh, methane being 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas when you factor that in you realize that uh, many studies have shown that um, natural gas the use of natural gas is going to be as harmful or worse than coal. So there is no benefit. The, 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 the notion that natural gas is a clean fuel is a joke. I understand a bridge fuel, but we need to get across that bridge quickly. Yeah, so th this is actual fracking gas we're talking about here. We're not talking about like dirty tar sand or anything. We're talking about fracking in Pennsylvania. We are like the fracking capital of the world, are we not? This is fracked gas from, from the Marcellus Shale region of Pennsylvania, and there's quite a few pipelines. Uh, last Yesterday, FERC also approved the Rover pipeline, which comes out of, uh, of the uh, Marcellus Shale and goes to Ontario. Um, Penn East is uh, a little bit behind us in the process. They've been getting lots of uh, very beneficial delays. You've got uh, the, uh, the uh, Atlantic Coast Pipeline comes out of Marcellus Shale. The Mountain Valley Pipeline, proposed pipeline, comes out of the Marcellus Shale. Um, the, the Pilgrim Pipeline, there's many pipelines. There'll be many more. Um, and they're all large, high-volume pipelines designed to get this gas to export facilities. And no matter what the industry says, that's where they're going. In fact, yesterday, um, Williams finally admitted that, uh, that they are delivering gas through this pipeline project to Sabine Pass, uh, which is, I believe, um, it's, it's in the Gulf Coast. So all these, they, let's say this gas is going to, the, to eat markets on the East Coast. What that means is it's going to LNG for export facilities to go overseas. Wow. Okay. So when you, when we talked earlier today, and I talked to several others earlier today, there was some hope you all had your fingers crossed that in fact, this would be squashed and maybe you'd get a three month delay or something like that because of the resignation of the one gentleman 
Can you just talk about the jockeying that kind of went on there so that our people understand that the nature, I know you kind of touched on it earlier. Yeah. I think this is an important yeah. political factor here. Extremely important. Um, FERC has always been um, just a rubber stamp for the industry. And what happened recently was Donald Trump, uh, as you may know, he was elected president. Um, yeah. Donald Trump uh, uh, picked Cheryl LaFer, who, who uh, is uh, one of the uh, FERC commissioners, uh, made her the chairman. Uh, and we believe because she's always been more favorable to the oil and gas industry with her decisions. Norman Bay, the existing chairman, I guess uh, Donald Trump thought that he was just going to uh, take another seat on the bus. But I believe Norman Bay said, to hell with you. I'm going to get off the bus. I'm going to walk. So his resignation was effective today. So the last week since he announced his resignation, FERC has been frantically trying to get as many of these projects approved as they can because as of today, they lose their quorum. Normally they have uh, five commissioners. For years they've been operating with three, and with only two they have no quorum. So for the next several months until uh, the Senate process can happen and they can get another um, another chairman, another um, uh, FERC uh, appointee, they won't have a quorum. So they ramrodded these projects through, and the Williams had asked for a February 16th um, decision, and they got a February 3rd decision. So the, the FERC has always just been about approving projects, rubber stamping, and pushing through. They have never, I think in once in their history, have they denied a project, a pipeline project. Um, and every time the environmental impact statement says no significant impact. But that doesn't ever take into account the impact on the human beings. It takes uh, it, it talks about the environment, which we know it's not true. Uh, but they don't even talk about the impact on the landowners that have a pipeline forced down their throat and they have no say in it whatsoever. So it, me, it represents what's wrong with our political system. It's it's, it's corporate and political corruption. It's about money, and it's so about let, we have a good day. Let, let's talk about this for a second because the state of Pennsylvania has a six hundred million dollar budget deficit right now. They're um, way behind in tax revenues. Uh, states being a wholly dependent on taxation and wholly dependent on uh, actual friggin' investment bonds and stuff like that. So when they're 600 million behind, it looks like they're willing to do different things to try and make up that shortfall. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is there not some kickback to the state of Pennsylvania for actually investing in these pipelines, uh, I, I really I, I can't speak to that uh, that much. I don't. I, I know there's kickbacks in which way. I mean, uh, politicians receive uh, uh, millions of dollars from the oil and gas industry, um, and, and the, the politicians, when they get to office, are certainly going to um, not vote against that industry. Um, so uh, that's a kickback. Um, Yes, absolutely. Um, but you're, speaking financially, uh, the, the fact is that there, you know, we talk about jobs. The industry talks about all the jobs this will create. And studies are showing there's many more jobs are going to be created if we pursue renewables than yes. with the, uh, the fossil fuels. So right. if we want to create jobs, we want to create economic prosperity uh, that, you know, while <laughs> maybe saving the earth. That's the route to go. And that's not what's happening. And that's this pipeline represents all of all that's wrong. All that's wrong. Absolutely. So let me ask you, how many people are in your um, your group? You have a core group there meeting tonight. You had a special meeting, uh, an emergency meeting, if you will. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you guys are going through and where your head's at and what's next? Yeah, well, we, we've been uh, for weeks now. We've been uh, planning this encampment and developing um, leadership um, roles and uh, and roles for the people that will actually run the camp and and getting um, getting ready to actually start the camp and we had hoped we had a few more weeks and we don't we're we're there now so we're basically um, um, going to be busy if some of these people here tonight will be up all night we're making calls we're, we're calling um, calling for for everyone to come in if they can we have some people that are away for the weekend but we're uh, we're just stepping that up a little bit. We're making plans, uh, you know, the, the nuts nuts and bolts. You know, we need uh, portable toilets, we need generators, we need need this and that. And as soon as as soon as it's feasible, we're not going to rush into this. But in the next couple of days, in the next week or so, we're going to have a working encampment where we're asking people from across the country, across the world, uh, to come and join us and stay, stay for a while, stay for a day, but come and support us and letting letting the um, 
letting the system know that we just we're not going to tolerate uh, this kind of treatment anymore. It's a human rights. It's a it's a it's a social justice issue as much of an environmental issue. Absolutely. So let, let me ask you a question. Do you know how much work has been done on the pipeline to date? I mean, are, are you guys on the tail end of it? I mean, how do they how do they patch this stuff through? Where is the starting point? Where is the ending point? And where where is it currently left off, if you will? OK, well, there, there's another uh, way in which we, this has, is not at all like Standing Rock. Standing Rock, most of it was built. Nothing's been built. This pipeline was just approved today. Not a tree has been cut. All they've done is their environmental impact studies. I mean, we had surveyors in the fields with shovels uh, telling us that there were no artifacts out there. We knew there were. Um, they were looking for long-eared bats and whatnot. So the project was just not approved. So we expect as early as uh, maybe tomorrow that there may be tree cutting crews, uh, although we've been told by experts that legally they can't do that, but they have in the past. Um, FERC will give them permission to start cutting trees because if they don't get the trees cut by March 31st, they have to wait till October. Uh, and that's what the big rush was. That's why Williams was in a panic that they might not have a quorum because if they don't get their trees cut, they don't get to cut them till October. And a couple uh, a delay like that might just kill the project because investors would pull out and go somewhere else with their money. So, so the, uh, uh, just to clarify for myself and the audience, what is FERC? <laughs> FERC is a uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, it's a commission appointed by the executive branch. They're not really a part of the um, of the federal government. Um, they're they're an independent regulatory body, um, and it's important to note that they get their operating funds from fees collected from the industry. Okay, let that sink in for a second. The more projects they approve the more money they get to operate. Just think about that. Think about how wrong that is. So that's what happens. That the more projects they approve, the more money they have to operate. And, and, that's, and, and they have never, uh, they're a rubber stamp for the industry. Uh, the people that uh, staff for, are, uh, it's a revolving door with industry people. They go back to the industry. People from the industry come in as commissioners. Then they leave. They go back to the, the, the oil and gas um, industry. So um, it's referred to as a rubber stamp of, um, agency. Uh, they're not there um, to, they're, they're there to make these projects happen. All they'll do is, hey, let's put it over here, put it over there. Maybe we can put it up here. It's never about do we need it or not. The, 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 the notion of public convenience and necessity always comes out, yes, there is a necessity. There's, but once, they've, they've denied a pipeline one time in their history. Wow. Okay. So as we're looking at this, what do you think, hypothetically, because I, I, maybe you do know, I don't know, what does the timeline look like for them to actually start breaking ground now that it's been approved? Do you have any, have they done any public announcements have they gone to the county and said, hey, we're going to be out there this day? What, what are we looking at? Some of that's actually unclear. We were on the phone tonight with our attorney, and our attorneys don't know uh, because the law is unclear. And that's the law is unclear specifically to keep you and me in the dark. Um, but historically, um, very quickly after a decision is given by FERC, they will exercise eminent domain. And the people that haven't signed easements will get notices um, that they're appear in court. Uh, judges will make a decision. They will give them uh, fair market value. And even though the people um, you, the people are required to be justly compensated, they don't actually have to have the money in their hands to have their trees cut. And all it has to do is be in an escrow account. So Williams can say, we got the money in a bank account. We're coming to cut your trees down. And eventually they'll get their fair market value. So this will happen very quickly. The beginning of the, the tree cutting will happen very quickly. I know Williams had stated that they, uh, they'll they be doing work on compressor stations and other areas of the existing Transco line as part of this project, and that they won't start the actual Greenfield, 178 or 180-some mile Greenfield portion. Uh, the Central Penn South is what we oppose. Um, we always said they should stay with their existing route, and uh, they, they didn't. They're coming straight down, and it's a shortcut. Their words, a shortcut right down through the northern Pennsylvania, straight down to southern Lancaster County, where we'll tap into the, the Transco line, and they'll reverse the flow and take the gas south. Um, so, um, But we don't trust them. They could start digging any day. Uh, but the actual tree clearing, the irreversible damage, we expect that to begin Monday. Now, have you actually been collecting donations to support people so that they can be there live without having to worry about life? I mean, what, 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 are the, what are you fundraising for and how do we get funds to you if needed? What, talk, talk to us a little bit about how we can support you guys. 
in the next day, I think you will see we're going to get a GoFundMe account um, uh, up for um, uh, for this uh, uh, encampment specifically. Um, uh, donations have we've been taking donations and we've been doing a lot of grant writing and we've been getting um, some grants. Uh, we got a very sizable grant. Uh, I'm going to mention them uh, here because I uh, we're so happy. We got a very large grant from Lush Cosmetics who supports these kind of. Uh, uh, environmental and uh, animal rights and uh, social justice issues. So I do want to give a big shout out to Lush Cosmetics uh, for a huge grant that is going to help us to uh, get what we need uh, to make this encampment happen. Food, shelters, uh, whatever it is we need um, to make a, make it fairly comfortable for people to come here and stay for a while and help us fight this pipeline. That's fantastic. So have you been in contact with the local authorities? Are they aware of your presence? Are they aware of your intent? I mean, what, what, what is the collaboration like? Are, are, are they already breaking up jackboots? You know, are they, were they sympathetic? I mean, cause they, they're locals, right? I mean, what, what yeah. is the flavor of this? Actually, uh, one of the members of our, of our uh, community is very close with the Southern regional police and it's a very small operation. And she actually had a talk with them the other day and uh, they, they said, you know, we, we, we support you. We understand uh, there's only ever like two of them on duty anyway. So uh, it'll be the state police. Uh, the state police are the ones that are going to show up. Or state police, National Guard. Uh, it's going to be no different than out in Standing Rock because the local police um, uh, are not going to have enough um, staff. Uh, they'll, they'll pull people from other townships, but they will not have enough uh, people on staff to, to keep up with this. And um, uh, one of the things uh, we've been trying to do is reach out to the, the police and let them know that, you know, why we're doing this. Yeah that, you know, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it and, uh, and try to reach out to them, uh, knowing they're going to do what they have to do and they'll arrest us if they're told to, but, uh, it's more of a public relations statement, uh, than an actual hope that will change their minds. Excellent. I, you know, I, it's, for me, it's particularly, um, I feel very honored to be on the phone with you guys. You're, you're my fellow, uh, Keystone state, uh, friends and activists, and I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you face to face, but I fully expect to do that in the very short near term. Um, I'd like very much for us to be able to maintain a very close relationship through this. We'll give you as much air cover as you can, if we can. Uh, Real Progressives has a community of over 110,000 people. Plus, obviously, we, we're interconnected with an awful lot of other folks that are tied in with the different pipelines, et cetera. I wouldn't call us powerful, but I would say we are a voice of the movement. We will definitely give you anything that we can. Um, if you need constant, you know, updates, we can do that. I just want to make sure that we help you guys in whatever nonviolent way that we can. Uh, we, we do appreciate that, Stephen. We're going to take advantage of that. No one of us is powerful. All of us are very powerful. And that's the message that America right now needs to understand is that we – we have the power. We have more power than these corporations. We just have to organize. And actually, I've been saying, I think the Trump presidency is a great thing because it's going to galvanize us all and push people that are sitting on the fence to get off their ass and do something. And I think he's going to yes. really help push the, push that. I, I want to say, let me let me take a moment. I, I, w I wanted to make this about you, but I really do want to lay this on the line. I have been getting a lot of flack because I am a militant activist when it comes to what I say. I'm a firebrand and I have absolutely zero regrets for Hillary losing. If Hillary would have won, number one, your pipeline would still be going through. But number two, the worst part is, and I'm just going to be blunt. You, you can hide off camera so you don't have to hear what I say. But the vote blue sycophants that get fat and happy when a Democrat is in the White House these vote blue sycophants would have sat their butt home and said, well, you know, this is politics. Things happen. Yep. That's, you can't expect everything. What do you think? She's a magic woman. You know, just like they said with Obama. What do you think? He's a magic Negro. They always sit there and mocked us when we said, hey, we need your support. Well, what do you want him to do? What do you want her to do? Now, these people are out in the streets with their pink hats, mind you. But they are finally standing up. And it takes a Republican to wake them up. It's terrible, but it's true. So, yeah, yes. I, I have no patience when I hear people talking about, you know, oh, Hillary should have won. Trump should have won. I'm for Trump. I'm for, I said it doesn't matter. Corporations call the shots. The corporations run this country. Harvard and Yale and other universities have done studies saying it's not just a kind of thing. We live in an oligarchy. The corporations run the country.
So forget about who was in the White House. We had one shot this year at someone that may have actually bucked that system, and we saw what happened to him. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I, don't, I don't have faith in – I don't care if you're red or blue. You're being run by the corporations, and that's yeah, and what that- we have to – I want to just say something because I, we're, we're fellow central PAers. It's an extremely conservative state. I really, at least our areas are. I mean, we go out here, it was few and far between on the Bernie signs. Everywhere you go, you got a Trump sign, you got the stars and bars, you've got everybody with their hunting license on their hat still. I, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, Seattle here. We're talking about hardcore Trump supporters. And, and and quite frankly, they're not the alt right type. They're they're just country boys that vote red. Right. So you know it's a different flavor, and and it takes some getting used to if you're not used to it. But you are used to it. So tell me, do we have any Republicans actively helping you as well? Is this a is this a human thing or is this a partisan thing? Where where are we at with this? We absolutely do. Um, there's signs in, in Conestoga. There were signs around the election where you had a Trump sign and a Lancaster against Pipeline sign. And, and you know when I when I go to township meetings and talk to these Republican supervisors, I said, "You're conservatives. You know what? what <laughs> that's conserve. So um, <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's plenty there's plenty of, of Republicans in the movement and conserve people that people that understand. Uh, you know." that just don't follow Trump blindly people don't understand um, that this is about, this is about the federal, uh, this is about the state's rights. This is about more power at the local level. This is about keeping the federal government out of your business. Isn't that what, isn't that what they always talk about? Yeah. Absolutely. So, conservative guy, no, you're all watching right now. Uh, <laughs> get on board. This is for you. This is what, this is what you want and we're here to help you get it. That's right, man. Thank you. So, very, I, I really appreciate it, Steve. Yeah, no problem. Do me a favor. Do you have any parting gifts for the crowd? I want to make sure that they know any any contact. Just reiterate how we can get in touch with you, and I'll let you get back uh, to your meeting. Yeah, we are. Yeah, because they're actually yelling for me. They say they need me right now. Uh, the website is wearelancastercounty.org. Our Facebook page is Lancaster Against Pipeline. It's got the quilt uh, logo. And uh, you go on there, and very shortly we're going to have links to direct you to a new Facebook page, uh, I think, just for the stand, and there'll be a GoFundMe button there. Uh, We need funds, but more important than funds, we need people. If you can come here just for a weekend, just for a couple days, come on the weekends, come for a week, stay for a couple weeks, we're going to need – but we would love to see thousands of people here just like we had in uh, in North Dakota. We would love that. Uh, we would love to see dogs. We would love to see tear gas because it's one thing. Uh, so many so many people see that, oh, it's just it's just those natives. Well, we've got nuns here. <laughs> we've got uh, we've got uh, teachers. We've got uh, pillars of society here. Like good white folks, good Bible thumping white folks. Here. Let's stick the <laughs> Absolutely. So, yes, it's it's definitely a paradigm buster. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, all right, Tim, thank you very much. I'll give you back your night. You go ahead and have a good night. Thank you so much for your time, sir. We'll be in thank touch. You. Thank you for the opportunity. See Absolutely. You. Thank you See very you much. All right, folks, with that, this is Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. Hoping you guys learned something. Let's help these guys out. Let's get out there. Let's do what we can. I think it's so important that we as as citizens, as activists, as human beings, no matter what our political bend, that we get out there and participate in democracy, non-violent civil unrest, civil resistance, resisting what we disagree with is as American as the Boston Tea Party. It's as American as anything you've ever seen throughout the history books that we've ever been taught. Our government, has been founded on protest. Everything we've done has been an act of resistance. Let's keep it going. With that, I'm Steve Grumbine, Real Progressives. Have a good night, everybody.